Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Uh, this is where I do GM preps for the game Simba Room. Uh, I try to do efficient GM preps and once uh, I've played these sessions, I do recaps to tell you how it went, uh, how my prep went, did I use it, was it wasteful? And you will have noticed that my surroundings have changed a little. And that is, uh, that is uh, very simple, it's because my girlfriend needed the main office of our apartment. Uh, she's working at home all the time now uh, since the pandemic. Her job has switched to um, uh, distance working and it, it hasn't gone back to going to the office. Um, so she needs a full-time office now. And I moved my office to the, how do you, in French we say une remise. So I'm in the remise. Uh, I'm with the skis and with uh, all the stuff. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a true man cave in the pure man cave tradition. Um, this, this video that I'm doing right now will be a bit special because I, you know, it's been months since I did a video. I have a lot of sessions to cover. Uh, it's, a, it's a session recap video. So I want by this video to bring you up to speed in my campaign. And, uh, and so you, just for, so, for those who are following the stories um, to, to, to be up to speed with the story. Of course, I will sprinkle these sessions, uh, session recaps with some thoughts and some, some takeaways, uh, some GM tips and stuff like that, as I try to do uh, most of the time. You will discover also in this video that I, uh, I'm on Foundry now and I'm discovering this wonderful tool. Uh, I, I like it very much really happy to not be on Roll20 anymore. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about that. I'll show you some maps I made. I'll show you, you know, the prep was a bit more digital in this case. So you'll get to see some of that. Uh, I'll try to go as fast as possible, but I have no promises. I ha I I've had a very, very busy end of summer and beginning of fall at work. So, um, I just don't have time to edit this video. I'm just going to leave it as is, as if it was a live stream. Uh, please turn on 1.25 speed if you think I'm too slow. Uh, I, will, I will chapter it though, so you can skip to the parts that you like um, and that you can, you know, pick and choose what interests you in this video. Um, so that's, that's, that's the deal for this video. So let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead, let's, let's jump in. Uh, I think that for the first thing that I will do is I will show you just a quick overview of my foundry. Uh, it's very simple. It's not, um, how do you say, I, I've seen some people uh, do much more elaborate things, but as usual, I'm doing uh, efficient <laughs> GM prep. So bear with me. Uh, so let's go, let's go into foundry. Here we go. Uh, okay, so there we are. This is just, um, you know, just my, my home GM page. I use this little calendar here um, that I like just to uh, get some, some sense of where the action is. Uh, the, main, the main map that we'll use. Um, so yeah, here's the, here's the map. I've got the, um, I've got the, the, the characters are here right now. We will get to that in the, in the recaps. Um, we're starting Wrath of the Warden this first adventure of the Throne of Thorns campaign. We're finally in it. Uh, let's just see. I have some, I think I have some. So this is the, uh, this is the original map that you get when you buy the modules. So you have all the details. I've added some in. So this is the house of Tinid. Uh, Tinid is the, um, the little girl that the characters have saved at the beginning of Mark of the Beast. Uh, there's Kadra, one of the uh, treasure hunters of Thistlehold that is in the contact network of Edogai. Edogai is uh, one of the, of the PCs. Just for a, a quick overview of the PCs, uh, I can go and show you this here. This is the map for the players. Um, so I've, I've put all NPCs around it. You can see there's more down here. Uh, and that's just basically what they've done up to now. So you can see they started at Prios Pass. Actually, they started south of Prios Pass. They crossed the Titans during Promised Land. They did Howling of the, of the Damned Gods here in Prios Pass. Then they took a boat, uh, which was the boat with the River Maiden thing. 
Uh, the other trajectory here from Indaraz, that was when they went down. It's a backstory trajectory. They didn't play it out. It's a bit paler. Uh, so the strong yellow line is their actual uh, adventure, their campaign. So they went down the, on the, the Veloma all the way to Karnak here. They uh, met strange elflings and troubadours in there with some, some, some foreshadowing of, um, of things to come for the barbarian Mirizin. And then they uh, galloped all the way to here, which is the uh, location of the temple of Ophelia, which is the temple of Lodome, Lodome's father. Lodome is a knight of Prius. She's a, she's a knight uh, Templar. And her father is the commander of that temple. They went then to Temple Wall, finally to Th Thistlehold. In Thistlehold they did Mark of the Beast, they met Master Vernum, they found who was the uh, l'écorcheur in French, the, uh, the flayer. They, um, they, they took control of the, of the crown um, and the crown was given to the Ordo Magica and there uh, for a while the Ordo Magica tried to break the spell but didn't managed to and just put it in a in a sanctuary circle to stop it from having uh, evil influences over other people. Uh, they then walk through the forest to go all the way to here in the middle of the Odav territory where they played a blooming veil. It's uh, an adventure um, an adventure landscape that's at the beginning of the Wrath of the Warden book. There they confronted Na Etikel Ambriagos which is a, an ancient king of Simbarum times that was now a kind of a crypt lord with slaves, undead slaves. So they, they managed to defeat him. Uh, and on the way, they also crossed the forest spirit Eox. Uh, that is uh, actually the spirit that the Ambreagos line worshipped. Uh, and so uh, they went back to Thistlehold. And um, In Thistlehold, there was the beginnings of trouble with a group called the, um, if you remember, they're called the Swords of the Sword. So these, these youngsters uh, that were led by Dolani, um, a black cloak from Indaros, actually an ex-black cloak from Indaros, um, were, were basically attacking them because their group, uh, there's some things that are let's say that the cell swords that are fanatics of Prios do not like. For example, Edogai is teaching an ogre, Vild, how to do magic. Uh, there's a goblin in their midst that, that dresses like a rich, well, rich, like a well-to-do embryon. That they, 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 that's very not good. And they're, they're, they are a cabal of mages. There's Edogai is a mage, Vild is a mage, Mikariol is a mage. Uh, and so they were the um, the target of the uh, of the, the they weren't the, the only targets, but they were also targeted by the Cell Swords of the Sun in their campaign of defamation, of hate mongering, and uh, and violent tendencies towards people that are suspect to, of being agents of the of the Eternal Night. And so they confronted, they, they, uh, they did some investigation, they found their hideout, they took, took out Dolani, they confronted Dolani in front of everyone uh, during a, a riot, all, all that good stuff. And once everything was done, said and done, um, the elves contacted Vernum, Master Vernum, to ask uh, for the, the, the crown of Urian Loapak, so the crown uh, was still at the Ordo Magica after Mark of the Beast. Uh, for those who don't understand what I'm talking about, you could watch the previous, uh, the previous um, uh, sessions. Um, those are all adventures that most people play more or less in that order, or at least a lot of those adventures are adventures for the beginning of a campaign in Simbaru. And in Mark of the Beast, there was this, uh, this crown that stayed in Thistlehold after, after the end of the story. And uh, now the elves contacted Vernum to say, to tell him, you need to get this crown out of the Ordo Magica and back to the tomb. Actually, they, they offered to take care of it. So they just wanted the players to bring them the crown in the forest. By that time, it was winter uh, and there was a big snow and, and uh, like a very thick blizzard over Thistlehold for multiple days. 
because they um, because the elves were putting pressure on on Vernum. Um, during the confrontation with the cell swords of the sun, the PCs also had a little scrap, not a fight, but a big talk, let's say, with Cargoy Salamos and Serex Atio and Roya Garlaca, that were allies of the cell swords. So there was some tension there that was unresolved. And in the background, the witch hunter Baumelo from Mark of the Beast was still uh, very keen on getting his hands on the crown and on punishing any would-be sorcerer that would want to use it. Uh, so they, um, so they, they, uh, they accepted the, uh, to help Vernum bring the crown back to the elves. They convinced the Ordo Magica. They, like in, a, in an epic, chaotic scene of, of mind control, they took hold of the, of the crown, put it in the box on which they had put a, like a neutral, neutralizing ritual uh, to be able to move it around. And they went into the forest looking for the elves in the snow. They went to a logger's camp. Everybody there was dead, killed by rem some dragouls that were uh, wandering out of the Blooming Vale. They destroyed the dragouls. They stayed there for a while and then the elves came to them and uh, Mirizin the Barbarian was chosen to send to, to go give the crown to the elves and the crown possessed him. And so he left with the elves and there was some, some more shenanigans that you can see in the other sessions, uh, session reports. Uh, but basically, uh, when they came back from that mission, um, because the Mirizin ultimately broke the spell and came back, and they all came back, they were ambushed by Baumelo, Cargoy Salamos, Serexatio, and all the cell swords of the sun, and all, all this troop of extreme extremists from Prius. And there was a major, major scrap in the forest. Um, the Baumelo uh, henchman and Baumelo himself fled the scene. Um, Cargoy Salamos and Serex Atio were killed. It was pretty, pretty, pretty terrible. And in the end, the group went back to Thistlehold and they were put on house arrest because the mayor wanted to understand what was going on. Uh, and that is where we left off at session 48. So in session 49, we are in Thistlehold, the, P the PCs are under house arrest, and if there's no concrete proof of, let's say, um, the fact that Cargoy and Serex were, were wrong, it looks bleak for the PCs because these men were heroes from the war and now uh, they've killed them, so it looks really bad. Baumelo is of course telling everyone that that the PCs were wanted to, to take hold of the crown to do some dark magics with the crown in league with the elves. That the, basically the PCs are elvish agents and they are traitors and they went back to the forest to, to, to conspire with the elves and certainly come back to, to attack or dominate or destroy Thistlehold or something really bad like that. So that's, that's Baumelo's line uh, to attack them uh, in front of the, of the mayor and the authorities. Just before I, I get into the, a bit more detail on that session, I just wanted to... Um, okay, so, so here you have Mikariol, the young mage from Alberetta. Uh, there's uh, Stahl, is a flaming servant. It's the flaming servant to Edogai, which is a kind of... Um, it's a steampunk image. Of course, he's not a steampunk character, but he's a tinkerer. He, he has blacksmith. He, he dreams of creating artifacts and he already does create minor artifacts. So he's that kind of mage. Uh, this is Lodemé under a young, very young and very fiery uh, uh, Templar of Prius. This is Mirizin, of course, the barbarian. Vild, the uh, ogre mage. Uh, we have the Boded Goda, that self-taught mystic uh, goblin that thinks he's a priest of Prios because he studied in Indos, in the, the convent of uh, the Black Cloaks there for goblins. And we have a new character, a new friend uh, coming in the, the, uh, this, this campaign. And he created a um, female changeling called Milian. Uh, she will come in later on in the story. Let's start session. 49. So I will, I have here, I can show you that. That's interesting too. Um, I have 
I have here a Discord channel. Um, and uh, this is where we, you know, exchange ideas and do some... That's where we use the video function to do some... Um, to do the actual gaming. But um, we also use it to do our uh, session reports. And this is a session report. They, they messed up the numbers because they, uh, the players considered that all the sessions that we made this uh, this summer was only one session and I split them in three. So this is actually session 49. So when they're back there was basically it was kind of a downtime with some tension. So that session I wanted to wrap up the story of the cell swords. Uh, I wanted to get out of the winter to have some some downtime and I wanted to um, to get some kind of a resolution uh, of that, that thread before we moved on to the beginning of Wrath of the Warden. So I, I, I sort of let the players do what they wanted in the context of being under house arrest, which, with, which was pretty limiting. So the first scene was Mikariol going back to the academy with Vernum, of course escorted by, by guards. And once they are there, Vernum takes off his iron ring and puts it in an iron box um, and tells Mikariol that this, this ring can, you know, make you communicate with the elves. Um, they, they hide the ring uh, and Vernam sort of, in a, in, a, in a certain foreshadowing, says that he expects that he will probably have, take the blame for something in this story because his, his friendliness towards elves is, um, is like a bad, badly kept secret. So he might take the fall, and if he does, uh, he wants Mikhail to um, to take care of the academy, and to decide if he wants to use that ring and take his place. Um, during that time, Vild the ogre, Bo the goblin, and Edogai, the master of Vild, are all at the shop, and Vild uh, com com um, does a communication, magical communication, with the tower of the Ordo Magica, and he learns that. Some, some building is burning near the Ordo Magica. Uh, he goes down to the front of the house where the guards that are uh, res making this house arrest thing being respected, um, he, he tells them, you should do something, you should, you should uh, go get some help or whatever. And they, they don't, don't really believe them. And anyways, they're cons they consider that somebody else will take care of it if there's something really is happening. Melian, that's where we introduce this new character. Uh, she's a friend of Mirezin. She Mirezin stays at the Witch and Familiar um, uh, Tavern. So they, they had a, a, a lot of a drinking bout the, the, the day before. So now Melian uh, leaves Mirezin in his bed. He's, he's snoring and leaves to the shop to, to give some information to the guy. Melian is not under house, house arrest, so she, has, she, she can be the messenger for the group. Uh, she notices that there is some smoke uh, from the south end of the city. She goes to see what's going on. She sees guards. She convinces them that something's going on. Um, everybody, anyways, everybody notices that there's a fire. I mean, it's funny because the players think that it's really important that they should tell someone. But of course, all the neighbors of the burning house are already in panic mode. <laughs> so, but, you know, I don't know. The players don't think about those things. <laughs> Um, okay, so Milian turns in, has some witch powers, can turn into a squirrel. She goes to the shop, to Edogai's shop, and to get in, uh, because there's guards in front of the door, turns into a squirrel, goes up to the attic, and finally meets Bo in pajamas. Uh, and they, there's like a little scene, a discovery scene, and then they, they all get together. Milian tells them what's going on, and... and offers help to, to keep the, the um, to be the messenger for the group because Mirizin asked her to. Um, the, thing, the thing is, is that the characters know that there might be, they suspect that Cargoy Salamos might uh, have kept some dragouls in his basement because they, uh, they spied on him using clairvoyance. Vild saw him bring raw meat to the to the basement. Uh, so raw meat is the food of undead, 
they know that now. Uh, and they had learned way before, uh, like a few, a, session, a few sessions before, that Cargoy was not the same man after the war because he lost his wife and his, his only girl during the war. And they, it sort of clicked for them. They really found it like straight away. And, uh, and so they, they just didn't confirm it. They, they just had this hypothesis and they told it to Melian. So Melian uh, goes to the, to, the, to the house of Cargo y Salamos, which is, of course, that, the house that is burning that they had seen earlier. Melian goes in, in the house. I, I just want to, you know, get, go a bit faster. So <clears throat> basically the house is burning Milian is going in and manages to find the entrance to the stair to go downstairs, goes downstairs as the upper stair is burning and ends up face to face with the two dragouls. He opens, he unlocks the doors of the two dragouls and flees. And so the dragouls start shambling after him and he didn't stay to try to talk to them or anything. Uh, which which I would have liked because dragouls, as you know, are very different from one case to another. Some some undead are completely mindless, you know, zombies, and some other undead. Most of them in this setting um, have some kind of vague recollection of who they are and what they should be doing, but they don't necessarily know why. And but they can have some of them have quite all of their memories and are still basically the same person but with with this weird this weird ailment of theirs um, and so so he finds this and um, and and flees I, I I'm just trying to recollect but basically the uh, the dragouls aided by Melian succeeded at exiting the house and so were created some commo commotion and were seized by the guards and the, um, uh, and the church. And unbeknownst to the, the players, these ragouls are presently held in the catacombs under the, the temple. Uh, because it's a noble lady and noble... They couldn't just put them out of their misery right away. They, they had to keep them and interrogate them and... And so those dragoons are, are still alive. Um, they might be useful later on in the story. So once, once that was done, uh, a few weeks went by where there were interrogations, but all of that I sped up. It's like it's downtime. So I just described how these, these um, uh, investigations were going along. The fact that some dragoons were under the house of Cargo y Salamos really put a... Uh, created a lot of confusion because Baumelo was showing that the, the PCs were conspiring and agents of the dark powers. And suddenly uh, his own heroes or allies were visibly entangled in very dark stuff. So it really uh, sort of, um, it, it sort of created a, a, a fog of confusion that um, made it easier for, for the mayor, La Cifar Night Pitch, um, to sort of minimize what was going on. It was like there was two groups that were both theoretically full of good intentions and that were trying to do the best for the city and that confronted each other out of, uh, out of miscommun miscommunication. And, uh, and so it was an unfortunate accident in a way. And so they just found, um, they did a few things to calm the populace. Uh, Lassifa decreed that all changelings should, um, should wear a special ring and should denounce themselves to the authorities to be able to stay in Thistlehold. Um, and of course, any contact with the elves or any, any ties with the elves is completely forbidden and any elvish activity must be reported immediately. Uh, and Vernum has, was banished, um, banished for his, his role uh, in, the, in, in being in contact with elves. He could not be trusted anymore, so they banished him uh, as a symbol. 
Uh, and once that was done, they, um, they hung a few of the cell swords of the sun, the, the ones that had put fire to the mission house of Sarvola because the arson is a, is a terrible crime in the medieval ages. So they did that. Um, and Delany and Edragar, his, his second uh, in command, were banished as well. Um, last thing that, uh, that happened during this period of the story is that Wild did, or was it Wild or I don't remember, they asked somebody, I think, to help them with that, uh, a friend of the Ordo Magica, and they did a Tale of the Ashes on the house of Cargoy Salamos, and they discovered that Roya Garlaca was the last one to come to the house, and she was the one that set it on fire. So Roya Garlaca was uh, devastated by the death of her friends. Um, she is she desires vengeance, but but at that moment she she wanted to when she discovered her for herself she discovered the dragouls, and so she was traumatized to see that her best friend uh, was was doing that, and so she's still in shock and she just burned the house down to try to save the honor of her friend, and uh, fled to Indaos. That's what she did. Uh, the players don't know that yet but they know she set the house on fire. You know, there was like almost a month of investigation where they, the authorities did some interviews with young Cyril Swords. You know, they wanted to find, find out who did what, basically. And it took a month. And so at the end of that month, that's when they banished Dolany, hung the Cyril Swords, banished Vernum, and all of that. After that, um, during Agani, the month of Agani, Lodome went to the temple of Ophelia to go talk to her father and to, to report. Wild went to Kurun, la, the capital of, uh, of the new Berator, and he, um, he did his clairvoyance to check out what was going in the Blooming Vale. But, to his surprise, he was not able to penetrate the tower. And the reason for that is because um, uh, Kulin and Furia made a sanctum ritual to, to stop people from, from peeking in. But he doesn't know that. Um, uh, he did a cunning check to try to know what was the source of this blockage, and I told him that it was actually uh, Ordo Magica magic. So he, so he knows that something's going on, but he's not sure what, and the, his instinct was to think that Naitikel wasn't completely dead, that there was some, some other nefarious activity happening there. And then that was the, the end of the session. So we, we, we ended the session when uh, Baumelo, in, in the spring, Baumelo with his henchmen left from the east, ta uh, the east gate and was gone from, from, um, from Thistlehold. And so uh, that session was, it was a downtime session. Uh, I wanted to, it's, it's always delicate. You, you want to give some good screen time to, you know, things that are quite important, like, like uh, the trial and stuff like that. But in this case, I didn't want to play it out in detail. I didn't want to, you know, it was, there were so many witnesses in both cases, so many people to be interviewed, that the authorities had a pretty clear idea what, what happened, and they just needed to do their job and decide how to punish and how to, how to bring uh, order back to Thistlehold, and this is what they did. Um, and we're not, in this campaign, we're not into... Um, uh, let's say, um, trials and that kind of play. I, I've done a lot of faction play in my previous campaign in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. In, th in this campaign, I like the faction play, but I want to keep it rapidly moving and, and, and pretty light in a way. Um, I mean, it's going to get heavy later on, but in the forest, not in Thistlehold. I don't want to, to drag things out too much right now. And so now we can move to the next session, which was uh, session 50. This is the, the session where I started Wrath of the Warden for the first time. And this is, let's say, our first session, real session, after the, uh, the, the summer break. Um, 
And I had to create things because that's when I introduced Foundry in the mix. And um, I want to prep for one hour, for four hours of play. And now I prepped zero hours and we play like six hours. It was... <laughs> Why, why did that happen? It's simply because I was working and I didn't have any time at all to prep whatsoever. So I just took the book and I played Wrath of the Warden, the first scenes, as printed. And I will tell you how that went and how, yeah, I, I had some concerns, but I went through with it. And just before I start this session 50, uh, I'm going to get a beer. So, and I... I I think you should do too, <laughs> and I'll be right back. Okay, so I'm drinking some uh, Helix uh, Bière Sans Gluten, uh, gluten-free beer. This one is called uh, Saison Houblonné, so it's got some hops in it. Let's see what it looks like. Uh, you know, I wanted to do this long video just because I wanted to get up to speed with you guys and gals as fast as possible. Um, and that's life, you know, sometimes life is, uh, sometimes you have more time, sometimes you have less. So I decided that I wanted to do it anyway, even if I don't have as much time as I did like last, uh, last winter. Uh, but here, here we are with this uh, wonderful beer. Cheers to you. It's really good. Um, there's not many beers that are gluten-free and good. <laughs> That's pretty rare. Okay, so let's hop into session 50. So I, first of all, I, I need to talk about Foundry. I decided to use the Forge as the uh, as the host uh, for the for, for for the game, just because. Um, I don't want to learn the technical stuff um, and we're, I have s six players now and we're seven to pay six dollars per month. So I think we can afford it. Um, and so that's why I decided to go the easy way. And I created this, this here, this game. I, uh, I'm starting to get pretty, pretty comfortable in it, in the game. I really like it. Um, I bought um, Dungeon Alchemist to do some maps. Uh, I bought also Flowscape that I didn't use yet. Um, and I started creating some maps for the games. So my, my prep ratio is out the window. It's completely bad. It's, it's horrible. Um, I definitely want to buy the VTT modules when they come out. It's really fun to do. It's it's really relaxing. It's a it's a good time prepping your things, you know, choosing the music and all of that. It's just that I don't have that that kind of time all the time. So like most of the time I don't have that kind of, kind of time. So I really need help and these VTT modules that are sold are are a really good way to have some really quality gaming online uh, without spending so much time prepping. Of course, you're spending you're spending some money, um, but the way to maybe mitigate that is that um, for for certain adventures, particularly, uh, you might just buy the uh, just buy the VTT module, and that's it. You know, you have all the text, you have the stat blocks, the tokens, the you have everything you need to run the adventure if you buy the module. So you don't really need the book or the PDF. And I know Free League might not like me to say that but that's the reality if you you know it, it's pretty expensive uh, i hope that when they um when they start selling the vtt modules for th uh, throne of thorns that they'll have some you know special bundles and try to make it as cheap as possible if we buy all of them because i definitely want to buy all of them um but you know i don't want to buy the same material twice so Anyhow, so there, there we go. So we, um, so I created this map. Of course, there wasn't the sinkhole there at, at the beginning. And we started the, to play this session 50. And the session 50, as printed, uh, means that Mikariol receives 
the goblin messenger from Anadea. And she, she sends the goblin messenger to Mikariel because Mikariel is the new master of the academy. And she's hoping that Master Vernum is, you know, maybe gave some information to Mikariel and maybe Mikariel will be a bit more on her side. Uh, Mikariel finishes his day calmly, does not go right away, <laughs> and uh, goes by, picks up all the group, and they all go to the, the Fern Tavern. And they get there. The Fern Tavern is somewhere. There we go. So it's around, it's, it's on the promenade somewhere here. They, they meet up with Anadea. And they see this young, uh, very, uh, I would say insecure, but she's, yeah, she's, she's stressed out because she, the elves gave her five days to find the source of the corruption that entered the, the, the city. And she has some kind of a vague idea of where to look, but she doesn't have many clues. And so she's feeling the pressure. Uh, and they all, go, they all come in, they start talking with her. That's where we, I had the first issue with the, with the printed material, is that, of course, to get them all to leave without her is, is really hard. They want to leave people behind with her. Um, it's bizarre that she doesn't go with them to check out what's going on. Uh, I'm talking at the moment where there's the le toxin, which in, we say in French, the alarm bell that, that rings and there's something really bad go, going on at the north gate. So of course everybody wants to go. So why shouldn't she go? So I tried to... At first I, I role played her as if she had something to fear from the authorities because she, she left the temple of Ophelia uh, you know, not in a normal fashion. She just disappeared from one day to the next. And so, so I, tr I, I tried to use that as the reason. But finally, they sort of convinced her to come and she, she just went with them and she said, okay, but I'll, I won't mingle too much. I'll stay back a bit. I'll, uh, and so they went up there. They discovered what was going on, that there was these huge, these huge creatures in the north of the, of the town, the Colossi. Uh, and when they decided, when the, the guard asked for help to go meet them and ask for a translator, uh, and they decided to all go out of the city to see that, that's when I used the opportunity to have Anadea say, okay, I'll, I'll go back to the Fern Tavern and I'll wait for you there. I don't want to go out. Now they were all curious of knowing what was going on outside, so they didn't really mind. They let her go. She went back. They, they stepped out. And they met in, the, uh, in the, the, the space in front of the gates. I showed them the, the nice image. I described uh, Gadramon and Eferneia with uh, you know, the felt robes and the, 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 the leathers and the masks. I put them, I put, if I go here, I can show you uh, what I used as portraits for them. It's not ideal, but I described like this doesn't really look like a maybe it's not feminine enough as a as a silhouette but i really like i really like the red the the felt the feeling of felt uh the the very severe bark um bark mask and gadramon has these little horns and is a bit more a bit more aggressive in a way in in his presentation a bit more spooky and they, they did the scene as printed. They negotiated with them. They went back inside exactly as printed. I really, that's pretty much easy, pretty easy to run. And then when they came back, the well spoke. And they, you know, had to roll to protect their ears and all of that. I described how people were, you know, screaming and falling to the floor and and so it was it, it was like one thing after another if you're talking about a railroad that's a railroad <laughs> that's a really it's not a, it's not you know it's it's not too bad in the sense that it's not in the middle of a story it doesn't last long it's really the intro to uh, to a film or something so it's okay i guess but it means that 
me as the GM, I'm talking, describing, trying to give it the most emotion I can, but there's not much that the players can interact with. They're just, they're just getting it all in the face. And so, and they were, I talked to the players after and they didn't really mind. So it was just for me, it was a weird feeling because I never do that usually. And in that case, since I had zero prep, I was just running, uh, running it as I could with the book in front of me. Um, and so they, they finally start to feel the ground trembling and the, 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 the big cracks of this, of this um, uh, destruction of Thistlehold, the sinkhole appearing, the smoke and the, and the, and the dust like the 11th of September 2001, you know, that like a, a wall of, a f of, of dust in the streets moving towards them, people fleeing. And I, 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 I took time to say that it, everybody's so much in shock that it took a while before they got moving towards the commotion. <clears throat> and that's really important because the first thing they meet when they get there is, is uh, clan beasts and they get attacked. And so these, these clan beasts need to get out of their hole first. That takes a while. So that's 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 a bit of a weakness I find in the in the way it's laid out. Um, I mean the the sinkhole is as much a surprise and a trauma to the people down in the caverns than to the people of this hold. So they couldn't react that fast. And the and the fact that they send these these people in the city to try to create commotion while the rest of the tribe flees, that's I mean, that's a, a strategic decision that you take after you've decided with the group, okay, let's leave. So it, that takes quite a while to try to negotiate with a whole tribe that's, okay, we need to get out of here. You guys go sacrifice yourselves up in the city. I mean, it's... So I tried to just create um, some vagueness about the timeline there. I said, you know, you don't know... It, time dilated or something or, or you don't really know what happened how long it lasted when everything crumbled they were just wandering in the street towards the sinkhole there was smoke and dust everywhere there maybe they stopped to help just people that needed help there was a, a like a, a little a little um, moment there that was just narrated and then they find their first their first encounters and I did play out the whole series of battles and encounters and as in the book. I, I tested it <laughs> for real, for you. Uh, I, would, I would need to, to, to do a little uh, survey with my players to see how they felt about it. But when, when we played it, it took two sessions to, to go through all the battles and all the exploration and all that, all that stuff. And after each session, I was, I was telling them, you know, this is pretty spectacular. It's pretty unheard of. It's not, uh, especially as we had a, a new player, I was saying, you know, this is not a typical, um, a typic, the typical fair for Simbarum. Um, there's, not, uh, there's not always major battles like that that take whole, the whole session. But in this case, they did. And uh, I had to do little... Uh, verifications with them and they, they, they loved it actually. So, I don't know. I was, I was uh, worried for nothing. So I created this here, Bataille dans les rues, so it means fight in the street. Uh, so it's a map by, I don't know if I have the name, Patreon, Miska Maps. Uh, so thank you Miska. This map, one of the free maps that you um, that you have there out there on the internet. Uh, it's a very nice map of many streets, and all I did was add here in the corner uh, the hole. And um, and so I, I used the map for two things. I used the map for the first arrival at the hole. So that's when they, they help um, Erlabert and Briagos. They help, they see two youngsters getting killed, two, two young uh, teenagers. Uh, they help a lady that's defending her, her, uh, 
her family. Uh, so there's like three fights there. And I use the upper portion here, this, this street. So they were just moving towards the sinkhole. And of course, in the city would be, you know, the map would be rotated another way, but who cares? <laughs> I just told them. I say, okay, this is the street you're on and you're going towards the street, the, the, the sinkhole. And so they, they just walked straight up, basically. And then they got to the sinkhole. There was a big fight at the sinkhole where they met the three Templars. Another big fight. Uh, and I think that's when we ended this session. Yeah. They talked about... Because what happened that's interesting and that was, you know, something that can happen in that adventure and that you, as a DM, uh, GM, you don't know what will happen, uh, what the players will think uh, regarding the plot of the story. And they knew that there was a source of corruption that entered the city because the witches, Gadramon and Nefernaya, told them. They knew that, um, that the well had spoken. They don't know why exactly at this point, but so they, they immediately thought uh, somebody has brought something new into town or the, or the crown is back, but the crown isn't that powerful. So they, they, they mostly thought, okay, somebody brought something back. Like, like it's a theme. This is a trope of this game. You know, people come back from the forest with bad stuff and it creates mayhem. And that, because that's all they know now, <laughs> up to now. So, so they, they start with that idea. And then at the, at the edge of the hole, there's a battle. They see other mages throwing fire on the other side of the hole. There's, there's a lot of fighting all around. They have a huge fight. You know, they, they've had people going down and having death saves. And it was pretty intense, all of, all of those fights. Uh, Mikariol with his brimstone cascade master and he's a master wizard so it he needs to fail three times for the chain to stop so it's he, basically he gets a shot against every enemy in the scene when he throws it uh, so the weaker enemies a lot of them die or are really badly wounded it's it's really like napalm it's air support uh, and in this case they truly needed it because I, I followed the guidelines of, the, of the, the module, but I considered that the Flaming Servants, the Templars, anybody in their group is a PC for me. So if it's PC plus two, then it's the whole group plus their Flaming Servants, plus their, their, their allies, plus two. And sometimes I even added a bit more if you know, if, if too many get downed right, right from the get-go, maybe I'll add a few, like in a second wave. But, but I, I, I don't do it too much. It's just sometimes, sometimes it's, um, yeah, it's just to keep the, the intensity up. And, um, and so they, they fought all, the, the, all those off. They, a, a few of them were pretty wounded. The Templars were pretty wounded. Like, two of them were really pretty badly wounded. One of them was almost dead. Um, and th after the battle, they, they, they talked a bit with them. And Lodomé, because her father told her that at, during the spring, some, some knights should come out of the forest from the sun temple and they would be carrying something very precious. And that she would have to assist these people. And so they knew that these guys were maybe the, the ones with the precious stuff from the Sun Temple. And they already know that in the Sun Temple, when Elisabetta Vehara conquered the Sun Temple in the forest east of Carvosti, they know that they fought off something really dark um, because they met Alizio, is that his name? Or the, the Templar that is uh, established on a farm outside of Thistle They already met him before during the Cell Swords of the Sun uh, stuff. And so they, they heard that story of a very, very horrible fight against darkness in that temple. So they were thinking, okay, these guys brought something back from the temple and it's really bad. And that is the source of corruption. And so they tried to negotiate with them to say, okay, you need to show us this thing. And of course the Templars didn't want to. 
And they, they walked back to the temple together. Uh, they talked to the guards that were trying to, to start to put some barricades. They spoke to Decamedo, the captain, to, um, to, to get some news of what's the strategy here. And they, so they learned that it was a strategy of containment. So they said, okay, we're just going to take a breather, go back to the temple, put on the armor, because Lodome didn't have her heavy armor on and, and other people needed stuff also. And so they, they went all together to the temple and they negotiated with the Templars and they had them, they did some really good roles and they had the, them promise them to show them the thing, uh, but only um, if they accepted to be blindfolded to, to the place where it was hidden. And the Templars told them, it's not, this thing is not the cause of corruption. It's just a stone tablet. And, and of course they said, well, yeah, a stone tablet can be enchanted. And, and they said, well, scoop, spoiler, it's not in town. The tablet is not in town, so it can't be the, the, the trigger. But still, you know, they, magic is magic. It's complicated, it's mysterious, so the, the players are still thinking, well, maybe it's still that that thing is potentially still the problem. And once they, they've had this promise from the Templars, the Templars did not go back to the fight right now because they were too wounded. I have a special heavy wounds rule that I, I will de detail in an upcoming video on my house rules. But uh, so the, the players got got ready to go and went back and when they got back to the to the city uh, I had them I can show you in the city here so at first they fought they fought around the hole here and maybe they went around and were over there but basically they came out of the fight with the Templars they spoke with the guards here and De Camedo, Captain De Camedo. they saw that all these are barricades all the places that are being barricaded and they went back on Inidar's road and all the way to the temple. And when they came back, they saw that Marvelo was on his horse inside the perimeter, uh, of course, with, a, with, with an escort. and was riding from one barricade to another to try to make sure that everything was really well built and, and ready to defend. And he told the characters, we have a problem. Uh, we are containing this pretty well, but some, some bands of rovers have already got behind the barricades and are doing some mayhem in this area. In this area, and the house of Tinid, the young lady that they saved, is this one here. Or this one, I don't remember. But anyways, it's in this area. And so they said, okay, we're going in, we're going, we're going to just root out what's left and, you know, try to clean the house, uh, clean the, the, the city in this place and make sure that the enemies are inside the ring created by the barricades. And they went in, so I went back to the same map. So you can see that <laughs> efficient GM prep, uh, use the same map twice. <laughs> so what I did is I just had them start at the bottom here and go up. And I decided that the house of Tinid would be the this one here and this this is sort of a little mini marketplace. And, uh, and this is, I decided on the fly that it was a kind of a, a guild hall, maybe a seamstress or uh, maybe a textile kind of, of place. Uh, and what was happening is that when they, when they got to this, to this place, they were coming up the street down here they they saw some they heard some movement they saw some some things moving in the in the kiosks and basically the clan beasts and clan warriors were were pillaging and were just taking stuff and going back to this guild hall because in the basement of this guild hall there is a tunnel and it's through that tunnel that uh, that that it can go all the way to the to the sinkhole and that's where these uh, these enemies came in So we had a big scrap right there. And that, I think, is session 51. Yeah, session 51 was, was the end of, was the fight up with the Templars and the fight on this, on this place. So session 51, two big fights. 
Uh, some, some little role play in between, negotiation with the Templars, the Temple, uh, seeing De Camedo, Marvello and all of that, and then back into the fight. And so this, this one was a really nice one because there was a lot of, um, a lot of eyesight going on, like do you see the, the creature or not? Um, it, was, it was pretty complex for them. Uh, they, they underestimated the number of, of targets uh, because the clan beasts can be pretty stealthy and are maybe more, more uh, vigilant than stealthy, but they're, they were waiting for them. When, of course, they were, de they were detected by the enemies before every, everyone else because they came in with, with their lantern. We had this fight. We ended session 51. Is that what I said? I think so. And now in session 50, 52, uh, we need to get it into the, the guild, the guild hall. Uh, they discovered at the end of 51, they, they went to the door, they tried to get inside the place, they, they managed to see a bit inside and they saw that there was, you know, maybe 50 prisoners there. That they were, the enemies, the, the clan beasts and clan warriors and all that were rounding up people to, to bring them down as prisoners uh, in the tunnels. And so they, they were, they, they decided that they needed to help, of course, they were on a mission. So we had some people in the front here, uh, a bit of mind control going on with the, um, with the mystic, the beast clan mystic, controlled uh, Lodome first, then controlled Mirizin. And so there was a lot of trying to neutralize the people that were controlled. It's their weakness. I'm not going to stop to use it. <laughs> uh, and in the back here, we had some, some uh, two uh, soldiers of the guard and uh, Bo uh, that found a door that was locked. And Melian got inside the place as a squirrel and ran to, the, to this door here and transformed back. And in the middle of the panicked crowd with the clan beasts, you know, like rabid dogs herding the people into the stairs down into the basement, he managed to pick the lock that was on that door and to open it. And so when we started the, the next session, session 52, uh, the, the fight moved inside and I wasted, it's not a waste because it was really fun to make and it took me, I mean, it's very meditative to make maps. And so I made a map uh, if, if you're interested by that map, you can uh, just tell me in the comments and I'll try to send you a copy. So I used Dungeon, Dungeon Alchemist to create the map of the inside of this hall. And it looks like this. Uh, there it is, Guild Hall. And I must say that it's pretty... Dun Dungeon Alchemist is pretty sweet. It's, of course, it, it has a very specific look. It's a bit more cartoony than it, you know, for, for Simba Room, it's maybe not ideal. But you can, by using the lighting, uh, the color of the lighting, and eventually by putting a little filter later on or desaturating it a bit, you can still create some really nice maps uh, to try to... Um, you know, to, to, to provide some visuals to, to the players as you, as you play. This map took me a while to make. Um, uh, I can show you in, in Dungeon Alchemist, maybe at the end of the video, I can show you with th the 3D effects. But basically this is a, like a platform with a, a chair here. There's some, some uh, candlesticks that are, are not uh, lit up. All of these are columns. Uh, there's some seamstress uh, tools here, some barrels and stuff like that. Stairs to the upper portion and stairs down to the basement. And now most of the people got out. Uh, some people got down and so nobody's left. But when they entered, they first entered, all of this was covered in just people panicking. And there was a, a, a hemicircle of clan beasts and clan warriors herding them. And there was here some fighters, like four warriors uh, and a mystic holding this door and there was quite a fight here and the uh, the players uh, put the door on fire there was 
a lot of action, a lot of, of, of good action. And I would say that, um, I don't know, because, you know, a lot of people complain that Blessed Shield is OP, that, um, yeah, that, sh that armor becomes a problem after a while because you're so well defended that you, you, can't, uh, you can't be hit. Uh, but in this case, it was not a problem. Because, yes, Lodome is the one that has the better armor with the Blessed Shield and everything. And she, she is much more sturdy, which she should. She's a knight, you know. That's why you have knights in a group. It's so they can resist things. But, but strategically, she got mind-controlled once. She, of course, once she got in, she was able to kill a lot of enemies and to, 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 to sort of create a percé, you know, to, to try to f make the line fall and let everybody in, which is a role. And, uh, but, but it wasn't a game changer. Like, everybody contributed to this fight. Um, so I think it was pretty, pretty much balanced in the uh, player experience. And so we did all this scene here of fighting and Milian went down under, and that was cool because you can't see a map if you don't have a token in it. So when Melian got to the basement to see what was going on, I switched to the basement, and the basement was only seen by Melian. So here's the basement. Uh, so you see there's, the, there's a portion of the basement, a lot of stuff, uh, and here there's a, a metal door that leads to an ancient room with rocks, rock walls like natural formations in the back. So this is older than this. And here you can't see in the dark, but I guess, I don't know, maybe this guy can have a torch. Can you? Yeah, so here you see you've got some tunnels and then you go up this way and this way and this way and you get to this hole here, crumbled stairs that lead down into some kind of a um, catacomb of, of, of sorts. It's not a catacomb, but it's just some, some old tunnels uh, from the, the Cimbarian times or the times of Urian Loapak or something like that. Really old tunnels that were not destroyed when they uh, destroyed Haloban's fortress. And the players went down, of course, pursuing um, like the, the, the few, the, the clan chieftain and the, uh, or they call it a, a clan guardian. And his last guards were trying to, to herd 30 people down. And uh, they were pursuing that group, trying to save the people. But they, they had, uh, the, um, the, the, flea, the, the guardians uh, were a bit further off, so it was pretty tough. And so when they went down in that hole, we got to the mid-session point. And I said, uh, okay, I need a break. Because lo and behold, I had not prepared the next map. <laughs> I had no other map. Uh, I thought that it, I would just do it theater of the mind because we were going to the sinkhole. It's a, like a tunnel that leads to the sinkhole and that it wouldn't be that important. But we were in this very dungeon-y mindset with really cool visuals. So I decided, okay, maybe I should have a map to, to finish this chapter. So during the 15 to 20 minute, 20 minute break, I opened Dungeon Alchemist because that's why I bought this thing, because it's, it can be fast. And I created a new tunnel. And I, uh, there, I think it's this one. I created like really long tunnels to just lead all the way to the sinkhole. Of course, I didn't have time to, you know, to do everything super well. So I told the players, okay, there's, you know, it's, it's theater of the mind in a way. It's not exactly what you're seeing here, but it's the gist of it. I described the very old tunnels, very um, like full of, of dust and uh, some crumbling walls, sometimes some 
some uh, roots coming through the, the broken stone and stuff like that. But basically the characters came down here and were exploring really quickly a whole set of tunnels. And it was just at this point, the question, main question was, at what speed are you going? Because they didn't want to be ambushed. They were a bit scared, but if they went too slow, they'd lose them. So it was um, some vigilant roles for the, the leaders. Um, they, at first they weren't running, so I didn't ask for any quick roles. I was just monitoring the distance between the two groups and directing my descriptions in that sense. Here's the dead end. <clears throat> so this map, I, I, I truly made this map in 15 minutes. So that is the power of Dungeon Alchemist, if you need it. That was a, a dead guy. And then it went up here, went up here. There's another dead end down there. And here they went. And that, this here continues on, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So what I did is I, I just, once, <clears throat> once they got here, I would just uh, teleport them to the end of the, of, the, of the tunnels here. And then they kept on going. And they saw these openings on the side and they were just going through. And in the middle here, I had an ambush coming from the back and from the front. And we had one last big scrap against the guardian, uh, a, a few clan beasts, a few warriors. Uh, it was, they weren't totally in danger, but it, it hurt. It hurt a lot. These, these guys are, can dish out quite a lot of damage. And so they, they, they fought them off, they killed them off. But of course, during that time, that was the object. These guys sacrificed themselves to, to let the others bring the slaves home. So they, uh, the slaves got home. So when they finally got to the end of the, of the tunnel here, this would lead into the slope, the very steep slope into the sinkhole. I did not describe the sinkhole as like sheer edges. It's not like that. It's like a funnel. So it's very steep, crumbly slopes of rocks and earth and everything. And in those slopes, there are some openings to uh, cellars and stuff like that. And in the bottom, you can see the pile of rubbish of, of destroyed, destroyed buildings and some little cracks where you can sort of slip into the major cavern that's under that they don't know about yet. So it just, you know that since everything slid in this hole and there's only a little pile left, that there's more under. But visually, when they get in the sinkhole, they can't see the cavern yet. They can only see some cracks. And so once they got there, they spoke to the guards that were on the rim, tried to give them a bit of information, tried to evaluate how they could get down. Uh, they saw that the, the guards confirmed that they, some movement was, was seen. It was dark at this point in the, in the day. And so they don't know exactly what happened, but they know that the prisoners have been brought down. And that's where we ended session 52. It was... Um, they decided, okay, let's go back through the tunnels and go up and reconvene and decide what we're going to do. So this is, um, this is how we ended the session. And pretty spectacularly, it's, it's exactly what, what's described in the, in the book. Uh, in the book, if, if they fail some fights, then there would be one last mega fight at the sinkhole. If they succeed, which they did, in repelling these, these invaders from behind, then when they get back to the sinkhole, it's the anti-climax climax at the sinkhole, meaning that uh, there will not be another invasion from the sinkhole. Um, I haven't played out the moment where the daughter of Aloban comes and, and throws them like a last challenge before she leaves. Um, we, we will see how, how that will play out in my next session. But, but we did play until they got out of the tunnels. So maybe, maybe these tunnels are, you know, 
a bit too much for, oh, you had all of that under your house? <laughs> like, like it's pretty, it's pretty um, expensive. Uh, but in the moment, I needed something to keep this going and have fun. So I just created this map. And as always, you get the between sessions to find reasons why things are like they are. So at first, they might seem a bit surprising or exaggerated or weird. And then you retcon the reason because you're the GM and you have the right to do that. So I need to come up with a reason why there's so, so many tunnels that were not known by anyone. And of course, my, my first, my first um, like the thing that I think I will do is that this, uh, this uh, guild was very happy to have discovered these tunnels and were keeping this very secret uh, just for their own benefit. Uh, their own benefice, it's a French word, for their own advantage. We're getting to the, to the end of this video, so I will show you a bit of Dungeon Alchemist before we, we, we go. But first of all, I just want to do a little takeaway about Wrath of the Warden. So, as I said in previous videos, Wrath of the Warden is very modular, they're like sub, like little quests, because the main quest is super straightforward, pretty simple. I mean, if you sum it up, it's Anadia tells them that there's some corruption that entered the, the, the city and that it must be found. Everything goes to hell. We fight against the clan beasts. We find the, uh, the underground isle uh, and some information about, about who these pe people were. We have to discover at that point that this isle isn't the cause of corruption, which is not well written. That's, that's, that's the first thing that doesn't really work in this adventure, uh, apart from the railroady start, is that this isle is described as having, like, uh, they, they specifically say that when you see the cavern for the first time, the people with witch sight can see that it is full of corruption. So, of course, the players will think the isle is cro causing corruption. So that's a, that's, a, that's a problem. The Isle is a node, it, it absorbs corruption, but as long as it's still able to absorb some corruption, it shouldn't produce corruption. So, I'm, so this thing, I'm going to rule it that, it that it is very, it's like a very, very little, very slow and feeble aura of corruption. And the reason why you can feel the corruption in the caverns is because it's been doing this little feeble, feeble leakage of corruption for, for hundreds of years. So that's why it's, it's, it, started, it, it, it got to a certain level where you can feel it. But it's not an immediate danger. It is, it is more... Yeah, it's still a node that absorbs corruption, uh, even though now it's pretty much saturate, saturated. You can see in the Haunted Wastes, in the next, like a further off uh, chapter of the same campaign, there's another node, and the node comes to a breaking point, and when it breaks, it has catastrophic effects that are akin to a soul stone breaking and releasing all the corruption at once. So I see it more in that sense. That's, that's the way I want to I wanna use it. I want to, um, to have it have some kind of a logic with the, sunstone, uh, the soul stones, and the, uh, the other nodes in the story. Um, but still, nodes have a very strange link to the underworld, and there's really something interesting to create that's not completely described by the game, and that I think shouldn't be. You need to keep some, some, uh, some mystery going on. Um, so I, I really like that. So I, I'm going for my next prep video. I will be prepping next session and next session is tomorrow. So you'll get that video pretty soon. Um, and I need to, I need to figure out exactly how I'm going to play this because the next session will be the moment where they go down in the tunnels. Um, that's, that's, that's a thing that, that got me thinking when I was reading the adventure and that I really need to get, you know, to get in order before we get there. Um, so, for now, the players are thinking that the, the source of corruption might be the tablets. 
that the Templars brought from the, from the, the temple in the north. I don't know if they're going to go talk to the Templars before they, they go down in the caverns. I suspect not, um, because they, um, they want to save the people. So, so the ne next session might be a lot of dungeoneering still. And yeah, I, 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 I'm going to have to think about how I'm going to deal with this, with this part of the adventure. Because, you know, in my previous sessions, I had prepared a little network of caves for under the dolmen where, the, where there are some spirits of the clan, of the beast clan. Um, in those caves, I, you know, I mapped them out a bit. It's one of the entrances to the, to the tunnels that lead into Tisselhold, uh, to, I mean, to the Crystal Isle. So, so those, I think I might use those maps that I haven't used yet, uh, those little sketches. Um, I don't know if I'll do some Dungeon Alchemist with them because it's pretty time consuming and I don't think I have some time. Maybe I, have, maybe I can map something like a generic cave. So if there's a fight, I have something to, 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 to show. But, um, but yeah, I'm, tomorrow will be a session where I will see how my players are digesting this Wrath of the Warden adventure. Like with their characters, what are their hypotheses? What th what thread do they want to pursue? So it's pretty open ended. So we've been railroading for two sessions, like a full railroad action scenes after one after the other, and it was pretty fun. I think I think my players liked it. My players like a, a good scrap, and uh, they've had their fill. I think. So now we're all happy to get back to some role playing and to get back into um, maybe a bit more decision-making about what's going to happen with this adventure. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm digressing. I'm, I'm not, my mind isn't completely, uh, completely, um, uh, let's say, uh, tight tonight because I've had huge weeks of work. Um, I'll just say cheers again. What I was saying is that is that uh, my takeaways about this this uh, this adventure is that the the structure is very simple for the main plot. There's Anadea, there's the sinkhole. You discover the isle. You wonder what's going on, and then there's this weird tangent where the whole question is who is Anadea? Well, no, that's not true. It's the question is. What is the cause of corruption in Thistlehold? That's the, what the players will want to know. So that's, that's a major flaw in a dramatic sense, because if, if, you know, like in a movie or a story, there's always a major dramatic, dramatic question, which is, which is usually what the characters of the story are going after, like a question that they want answered. Like, am I going to eat? Uh, you know, am I going to survive uh, the snowstorm? Am I going? To... There's always something going on that that is a threat, and they they want to succeed at something. That's the major dra dramatic question. And and as as a, as an audience, there's always a major dramatic question too. And in this case, the way the opening of the story is set up, everything points to the fact that this corruption is a threat and that it must be found and, and moved out or destroyed or dealt with. So uh, players can investigate the tunnels, can investigate this all. They can do many things without ever thinking of going to see who is Anadea. Uh, it's really, really, it's like, it's like the designers decided that, okay, Anadea has the key to the elves that give the players the key to the solution of the story, which is like a very thin, like linear path on which to go. And that is, you know, the players won't do that. They won't. So it's very, it's a bit unfortunate. They, I don't know why they did it like that, but Maybe they thought that for beginning players, it's better to have something super linear. Um, I don't know. But in my case, it's going to be a problem. 
Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm just going to roll with the ball. As I said, you prep before every session and every prep is, is an occasion to see what's going on in the story at your table and decide what elements to use, what elements to maybe change. Sometimes characters think something about an NPC and they find out it's not the truth. The NPC is something else. So you can always change stuff in the elements around the PCs to keep the movie, the, the story moving forward. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, so yeah, so so Wrath of the Warden is really, unfortunately, has a lot of a lot of uh, dramatic problems to it. Um, there was a, a little a little uh, fly from from Davoka. Maybe I'm I'm attracting some I don't know some some attention from a, a dark spirit. <laughs> I don't know. Any anyhow. So okay, let's let's close this video. It's been long enough. I'm going to bring you guys into Dungeon Alchemist. The thing. There we go. And I'll show you some maps. So it's loading right now. I hope I hope things are going good for you. I know that the the situation on the planet right now is pretty pretty tense. I I would have many stories to tell you about all sorts of things we we helped some people, we, uh, so many things have happened during this, this end of summer. Um, okay, let me see. It's loading. It's a bit slow, but it's loading. So yeah, I hope that you and your families are getting through things fine. It's not always easy. For those who wonder, I've been working, I work as a director for TV, so this summer I shot some, a, a new series about something really non-political. <laughs> it's uh, basically uh, snack bars. So with a host, we went to 39 different snack bars in Quebec and we discovered the best poutine and the best burgers and, and all the best snack bar food that you can imagine. Uh, a lot of meals from other other nationalities also um, so it was it was pretty fun but it was uh, it was loads of work and there's another thing i did is i went to france to normandy in a festival called the uh, festival of courtrouville and i i uh, wrote and directed a short film uh, in uh, three three days in a laboratory creation laboratory and you can, uh, you can head on to notrecinemamaison.com. I will put the link in the description. There's an English version of the site. You can go there, check out what I do as a, as a director. Okay, here we go. Let's go into Dungeon Alchemists. So that's the, that's the tunnel map. Okay, so it has a little beginning here. And I'll just go quickly over this one because it was a quick one. So there's some, some elements here are ruins, like ruined arches, and there's some rocks you can use. There's some walls of rock that look really fake. So I use walls of rock, but combined with rock objects that I really just pile on one another to try to create structures. Um, and yeah, so, that's, so this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, you've got some arches there. Can I spin around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can I got some some crumbled stuff? Here, there's like a, a metal thing that leads to nowhere. Okay. So this this was the quick one, the one that I made in in uh, literally 15 minutes. I will open another one. I'll open the. Uh, let's go for the. Okay. Now where are they? There they are. So the guild hall. Let's open that one. Um, it's a problem this because I can't I can't put that much time into it all the time. It's it's crazy. But you know, let's put some light. Okay, it's a blue light. Maybe maybe no. Let's yeah. Let's go for the white light. Okay. So now, how go away? There you go. 
Okay, so I, I put some fire here just to have this idea that the door was on fire. Uh, so this is like the boarded up guild guild house. It was boarded up because because of the situation. Um, and let's whoop, how can I? Oh yeah, I just need to pull back. Okay, there you go. So you've got some, uh, you know, you've got some decorations here. You've got this is this is supposed to be a kind of fireplace with uh, with a chimney, but they didn't have the assets. This is the place where the guild master will sit while the congregation is around him, and um, he can write on a pile of books. Some seams, some uh, seamstress stuff here, uh, and the stairs down that lead that lead down. And so if I go like this to get a bit more ambience, okay, there you go. So, you know, this one took me quite a while. I think it took me like an hour and a half, maybe two hours to make, because I was just having fun like I am right now, and you know, just chilling out, having a beer, doing my thing. So I wasn't, I was wasting time basically. I was just relaxing by doing it. It's a, it's fun, it's fun to do. The advantage of Dungeon Alchemist compared to, let's say Dungeon, um, uh, Dungeon Craft is that, maybe Dungeon Craft changed, but this one, what I like is that I create the map, I export it, and I have the walls and doors and lights and everything is already built in Foundry, so it's ready to go. I can just import it to Foundry and put tokens in and we can play. So I really like that about Dungeon Alchemist. And also it's like, it's really fun to use. It's really a game in itself. It's like Minecraft for role-playing games. So what's cool about, uh, about this game is that when you use Dungeon Craft or other map making tools, it's more like it's more like work in a sense. You know, you really have to draw. You, you some things don't really add up. Uh, there's a lot of problems. There are problems in this one too, but the result is so spectacular once you you have it. You know, you can. It's just let's put some light, a bit more light. Okay, look at that. You know. This one maybe took me an hour to do. So look at that, you know, so much detail. And you have tools to just spray stuff around, like spray boxes. And then you, of course, you move stuff around. You see, this one is not logical. And, but it, it, you can really quickly get, get something that's really nice looking. See, there's a, like a broken door there. That's where the Beast Clan came in. This is the, uh, the first little room that's like an ancient room with rocks. And, uh, and there's a little archway there that leads into a tunnel, that leads to a little room here and another tunnel. And so that was a bit complicated because I needed, you see the walls, the rock walls are not really nice. Uh, and so I add all of these elements to really make it feel organic. Uh, and so the players need to go through that. And there's some, some vestiges of something that looks like some civilization. There's a metal door there and you go in to the broken stairs that lead down to the other tunnels. So. How cool is that? I mean, wow, it's really, really nice. So I think once in a while it's cool to have that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very strong proponent of just sketching stuff, like just sketching, you know, what, what, the, the, what the, um, the house or the place looks like on a piece of paper. I need to find the same thing for Foundry. My, my solution that I'm thinking of is to have a very nice parchment background that I can just draw on uh, and if I don't want to draw on it, I will draw in a, in a real, uh, I, I use Affinity Photo. Uh, it's, a, it's like Photoshop, but you don't need to, um, you, you buy it just once. It's an English uh, program. And so I, I would use that to just draw the shape of whatever place we're in, uh, export it with alpha. So that means that 
only the lines are opaque and the rest is transparent. And then bring, bring that as a tile in, in Foundry and just drop it or foreground or whatever and just drop it on my background that would be this really nice parchment. And so I can have an instant, like an instant map with no walls, no, you know, just basic a drawing on paper and we put tokens on it and we play. And I think that that is, that is as much a good tool to play than this super detailed and complex stuff. Because the power of the theater of the mind is so strong. If you do some great descriptions, you will get people into the zone and what they imagine is much richer than what a computer can, can provide. Okay, so let's go to, uh, let's open another one. Uh, let's go for the Gadramon's camp, just so you can see that in um, Dungeon Alchemist, you can have characters too. Uh, you can import some Hero, Hero Forge characters. I don't know if you can do it without paying, I don't remember. Uh, let's just go here. So this one is a bigger map. It's, you see, I, I can feel there's some lag here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of lag actually. Uh, so I'll just go quickly. So this one I did not use in the story yet. So basically it's where Gadramon and Efernea are staying outside of Thistlehold. So there's a character. And they have a fire, they have a tent. And there's some kind of a, a construction here, like a menhir, like a rock thing. There's, there's the other character. And so I can, I can click on a character and I can go in the character. And now I can see what they see, what the character sees. So there's the tent, there's the, the monolith kind of thing. There's fire. And you can even move. You can press on the arrows and if there's no obstacles, you can move. There you go, so you see that the pole doesn't touch the ground, so, you, so there's little, little problems. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not detailed enough that you can cover everything, but still, it looks really good. And having, having like this is weird too, like having stuff, uh, creating a forest uh, is really quick. And it's, it's a great tool, you know, this one I created for this size, I think there's like a little river somewhere. But basically I just wanted to be able to show it to the players and that there wouldn't be too much dead space. So I created some, like a bit more than, than what was necessary. And I put some huge stumps, tree stumps, because this was hacked down for Thistlehold. It's close to Thistlehold. And these, these, young, these young trees around it were either not interesting enough to be hacked or have grown since. <clears throat> so of course they're a bit tall for, for like 10 years, but, but that's the idea. And I, I would say that this is where the forest starts again. And if you go in this direction, it's more stumps and less trees. And that's where everything was hacked down to create this whole hold. Uh, one, maybe one last one before we, we say bye-bye. Uh, let's see. I'll see. I have, uh, yeah, that one, that's the, that's the shop of Edegai. So this one I did just like a love project. Uh, really like this one. So you see, this is the whole shop. Just hold it like this. So this is the entrance here. This is the street. There's the shop front here that you can open up on the street. There's, this is the exposition place where all the artifacts are shown to the public. And here is the private place with the table. There's a counter making waffles. That's a staple of it, a guy. He's always making waffles. And here in the back, you've, you have the fireplace. You have a, a mini forge where he forges some elements for his work. And the steps upstairs are actually stone in the, in the story, but I didn't have any for in the assets, so I just put those. And they go to the two levels upstairs. There's his office upstairs and there's the attic beyond. Uh, so if I go in 3D mode, you can see I put 
I put the uh, Stahl, the, uh, that's the flame servant here. Uh, so you can see I, I just put what I could find in this game as artifacts. So it's all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's some more on top of this here. And you can see that, whoops, let's go to the, how do I, let's go like this. It's, it's a bit weird the way it works. Anyways, okay, so there you go. You, see, you have more artifacts and these windows that can open, um, some food, some bottles. It's really nice. It's really, really fun. It's, this one is useless. I, I just wasted time doing it. Uh, I don't expect to be that there will be many combat scenes in this environment. Uh, and the 3D, the 3D views I can just output as photos. You can't really interact with them in, in Foundry, not yet at least. So, so yeah, it was just for fun. I just wanted to test out Dungeon Alchemists. I wanted to show, uh, to show that to my friend Antoine and to, to see what he thought about it. And uh, yeah, it was a, a nice little session of work to do this. I, I really liked it. So um, I think we'll end on this. It's been a pleasure as always to talk with you, to tell you about my campaign. Uh, as always, if you like these videos and you want to support me, put a thumb and go on uh, Drive Through RPG. Check out dry, uh, Playing with Goblins is an adventure I wrote. Um, I, I'm, I don't know how much time I will have from like during the winter and everything, but I, I will have definitely more time than I had this summer. So you can expect me to, to start posting videos again a bit more regularly. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe adapting playing with goblins to runes of Simbaroom 5e. I would like to, to, to do these efforts and have a bigger audience. Uh, if you want to share my videos and just you know, help me get some more people into it, uh, that would be great. Uh, the idea here is really to give a hand to the indie games out there. Um, Phil, uh, Free League are doing great games. Um, there's so many great games to discover and there's, I don't know, 20, mi 20 million people playing only D&D. So I would like to contribute to, to change that. And so I would like to expose other people to, to these games. And I think that uh, the strategy that many uh, publishers have of doing 5e versions of their games is a good one, actually, because it, it, you just you need to break, break the barrier. Uh, and for some people, learning a new system is too much. And so having the 5e logo sort of makes them feel comfy and at home. And um, I might, uh, I, I, I want to, uh, to go get those people and have them get interested in Simba Room. And maybe once they've played a campaign in 5e, they'll want to try the OG system. Maybe by then we'll have a second edition, who knows? So, um, so there you go. If you want to help me, um, g you know, get to those people, that would be a really nice way to support the channel. Uh, I really, I really like doing that. Uh, I would like to do some, some streaming, some live streams at some point to be able to chat with you guys. Um, but hey, one thing at a time. And uh, for now, uh, let's just say, uh, let's have a toast. A toast to gaming, a toast to fun, a toast to spending time with good friends in a, in a good atmosphere uh, with, you know, pleasure and... Uh, and loving each other all around. Uh, it's a great remedy to, uh, to counteract the bad vibes we get from, from these bad guys all over the place. So fuck them and uh, long live gaming and good company. See you next time.